In 1990, this quiet beach was transformed into a war zone. Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait, prompting a coalition of countries to combine forces to expel his army. Iraq had over a half a million frontline troops with another million in reserve, armed with a formidable array of Soviet weapons, including 5,000 tanks. The USAF had an aircraft in their inventory designed specifically to obliterate Soviet armor and provide the much-needed support for the coalition ground forces, the A-10. Curiously, General Horner, commander of air operations, almost left it behind. General Horner was called in by General Schwarzkopf before the actual assault launch to review what airplanes were going to be there. 1,900 airplanes to be assigned, zero A-10s. And Schwarzkopf looks at the, at the list and he says, where's my A-10s? And General Horner says, oh, oh we, we, have, uh, uh, we, we have F-16 specially armed, they'll, they'll do the job. Schwarzkopf looks at him and says, I don't want to hear any of your Air Force political bullshit. Give me my A-10s. The A-10s, aircraft that were at the time 20 years old, managed to outshine the 1900 aircraft that had been chosen ahead of them, destroying 4,000 tactical targets, a tally higher than all the others combined. With such an impressive performance, why was the USAF so reluctant to bring the Warthog to war? What was it about this tank-busting machine that repulsed them so much? To understand the mystery of the A-10, we have to look back to the origins of the USAF. In World War I and II, the Air Force had been a branch of the U.S. Army. Over time, the role of the Air Force evolved with improved technology and battlefield experience. Aircraft could provide vital aerial intelligence, drop bombs on strategic targets, and move troops and equipment. One of the Air Force's most important jobs was providing close support for troops on the ground. That is, working closely with soldiers on the battlefield and executing the difficult mission of destroying enemy forces without causing casualties to nearby friendlies. As important as this mission was to the overall success of military campaigns, it was despised by many Air Force generals of the day. From the day one, <laughs> Uh, the United States Air Force, going all the way back to the Army Air Corps, uh, there has been this uh, uh, antipathy to the mission called Close Air Support because it is tied to the Army or ground warfare. And it was uh, a mission that did not fit their view of them being able to independently uh, carry out whatever war that they wanted to and not be tied to what was going on on the ground, not be tied to another service. And they very early on decided that what they needed to do to get a decent budget was to emphasize that bombing could win wars. That idea, a very false notion by the way, uh, still runs the Air Force today. They thought they could get much more money if they built bigger and fancier airplanes like bombers, and if they put out a tremendous amount of propaganda that bombers by themselves could win wars. As much as the Air Force resented and resisted the close support mission, it was a necessary evil. Time and again, bombing alone proved ineffective at breaking the will of the people. Whether it was Germany's Blitz of Britain, or endless bombing raids of the Allies against German targets. Allied ground forces supported by aircraft had the dirty job of taking back Europe mile by mile. Soldiers often found themselves mired in the quicksand of war, the situation shifting from minute to minute. They needed pilots tuned into the chaos of battle. Infantry working outside the wire on a patrol they want something above them that can see all, communicate with them, help them with their navigation problems, help them see ahead, 
and so they won't be surprised. And if they do get surprised and they come in contact, they can get almost immediate fire on the target. By immediate, I mean within a minute. As much as the Air Force wanted to focus on bombing missions, they still managed to produce some legendary close support aircraft, albeit by blind luck. The P-47, which was the original Thunderbolt, that airplane turned out to be a close support airplane totally by accident, which was typical of the Air Force. Since the Air Force didn't care to do close support, obviously they weren't going to design airplanes for it. Uh, they designed the P-47 as their approach to the greatest thing in the sky, to shoot down Messerschmitts. In fact, it was not the greatest thing in the sky to shoot down Messerschmitts. It racked up a very good combat record in air-to-air -air combat because it had some, you know, fabulously good pilots which count far more than airplanes. By pure accident, it turned out it was a wonderful close support machine because it had a huge radial cast iron engine right in front of the pilot, which was like built-in armor for him from the front could carry a big load because it was a big airplane, too big to be a good air-to-air -air fighter. And the engine was very survivable because it didn't have a liquid-cooled engine and radiator. So basically rifle bullets couldn't bring it down very easily. The P-47 could come home with, you know, 20 or 30 holes in it. And so it racked up a terrific record. Close support was not considered the most glamorous job, but it was a vital one. The pilots of the 365th Fighter Group, also known as the Hellhawks, flew their P-47 Thunderbolts in one of the most important operations of the war. It was realized in the uh, Allied headquarters that they needed a tactical air force to support the ground troops directly during the process of the invasion of Normandy. So they needed a dedicated fleet of aircraft, both bombers, transport, and fighters, to seize control of the air and then support the ground troops. So the Hellhawks got uh, drafted probably not by choice, into that role. They dreamed of themselves as the high-flying pilots with the scarf streaming behind their neck, but they began to realize that they could play a crucial role on the battlefield, and they became very connected emotionally with the GIs on the ground and helping them out. The Thunderbolt's impact would last long after World War II. The aircraft's success would set the mold for all future close support missions. The importance of the P-47 and the Hellhawks and the way they use that airplane in combat is still with us today, 65 years later. Uh, it, since World War II, uh, with a few exceptions in Korea in the early days of that war, American ground troops have never fought without air superiority, without complete confidence that any aircraft they saw overhead was a friendly one. And that's a legacy of the P-47's uh, ability to control the, the battlefield immediately over the, the front lines where the fighting was heaviest. As the war came to the close, a new weapon emerged which changed warfare forever. The dropping of atomic bombs sealed the fate of Japan in World War II. It also seemed to solidify the position of bomber generals who believed that bombing could win wars alone. The U.S. Air Force was in a powerful position as it was the only service capable of delivering a bomb albeit one constructed with the Navy's oversight. Though the Army and Navy were not enthused about sharing their budgets with a young competitor and slowed and sabotaged the process wherever they could, they could not stop the inevitable. And on September 18, 1947, an independent United States Air Force was born. Though the Army and Air Force were separate entities, the Army relied on aircraft to operate to transport troops and equipment, and for the vital mission of close support. In 1947, a document was hammered out between the armed services to divide up the roles and missions of the respective fleets of aircraft. The Army and the Air Force had negotiated a set of unbelievably bad agreements, I mean, bad for the taxpayer and bad for the soldier, called the Key West Agreements, by which they agreed to divvy up air assets, the Army would be in control of all helicopters and the Air Force would be in control of all fixed-wing airplanes. And the deal was that the Air Force would not object to the Army getting very large numbers of these, would not object to them, you know, doing armed versions of them, and in return the Air Force promised, we'll give you lots of close support. A young colonel, Avery Kay, took part in these negotiations. He was a highly decorated and respected officer 
having navigated the lead B-17 in the Schweinfurt Raid, a treacherous mission to cripple Germany's industrial might. Colonel K soon realized that navigating through the politics stemming from the inter-service rivalries was no easier. He was probably one of the most ethical officers I've ever known. A guy of enormous character and courage, almost to the extent of naivete, of being just naive about, you know, about what bureaucratic chicanery is all about. He came to realize within a year or two after having served in these negotiations and written some of this language where the Air Force promised to deliver close support, he realized the Air Force had no intention of ever delivering that support. And out of conscience, he felt personally responsible and guilty that the Air Force had not delivered and that he had personally participated in the lie. And he dedicated the rest of his career to creating a close support airplane that would deliver on the promises that he had been part of. In just a few years, the USAF's short-sightedness when it came to close support became blatantly obvious. The Korean War was not decided with an atomic bomb blast. It was a grueling conventional war. Here, the USAF pinned their hopes on their speedy new jet fighters. They may have been state-of-the-art, but they were too fast and without the range to be effective close-support aircraft. P-51 Mustangs left over from World War II were taken out of storage and shipped over as a makeshift solution. These aging aircraft suffered heavy losses as their engines were vulnerable to ground fire. The Navy and Marines, with their A-1 Sky Raiders and F-4U Corsairs respectively, took the lion's share of the close support work, and they did so brilliantly. Close support was of the essence, particularly when troops were moving, when we were moving forward or when the Chinese were pouring over the border and driving us back. The A-1 was in fact a wonderful workhorse, shared the virtues of the P-47, had a big rotary engine up front to protect the pilot, was very hard to shoot down, you could put lots of holes in it. And because it had been designed to pull really big loads off carriers, had a very big wing, which allowed it to maneuver very well at low speed. That airplane did brilliant work, particularly in the hands of the Navy squadrons that had it. The USAF seemed blind to the lessons learned in Korea and oblivious to the idea that there might be another conventional war. In the years that followed, they continued to focus on building nuclear-armed bombers and jets in preparation for an atomic war with the Soviets. The Army realized that they might have to take the close support mission into their own hands. Chuck Myers recalls Army tests he participated in at Fort Rucker. A lot of guys in the Army, particularly on the aviation side, felt that the Navy and the Air Force were not going to provide them what they needed, which they referred to as organic air support. The only option they had was somehow try to figure out how to do it with helicopters. And that's what was going on at Fort Rucker, was experimenting with um, helicopters. They were reinventing our old Army Air Corps. My primary helicopter that I was using was an H-13. They had strapped 30 caliber machine guns to the rails. When hostilities boiled over in a tiny country in Southeast Asia, the USAF once again found themselves unprepared. Well, what happened in Vietnam uh, is we went into Vietnam and the Air Force, in particular with aircraft that were not suitable for uh, the situations that we encountered. In disguise, the USAF needed agile dogfighters capable of keeping up with Soviet-made MiGs. Instead, they had aircraft built to drop atomic bombs and fighters that lacked the basic cannon for shooting down opponents at close range. In terms of close support, they were just as ill-equipped as they had been for the Korean campaign. The USAF were forced to use ancient Navy A-1 Sky Raiders to take up the slack. In Vietnam, the great hero of the war was the A-1 again. And the A-1 by that time had been sent to the phone yard. The Navy didn't want to hear about it. And somebody in Special Forces had the sense to see, we need that airplane. And convinced Secretary McNamara to bring A-1s back out of the boneyard, refurbish them. Not surprisingly, 
The Air Force were less than enthusiastic about having the Sky Raider jammed down their throat by McNamara. There was nothing that was more hated in the Air Force than to pull out a Navy airplane that had reciprocating engines, no jet, you know, cruised at about 140 miles an hour, right? I mean, this was like anathema to the Air Force. Though the Sky Raiders were an unwelcome gift from the Navy, they proved themselves again, just as they had in Korea. The A-1 was a very fine bombing platform, and we could get close to the target and be far more active than they could with a, an F-100 who had to go up, drop his bombs, and get back home quickly before it ran out of fuel. It saved probably several hundred CIA camps in the jungle that were being overrun you know, at night by VC and some North Vietnamese regulars. It would take ultimate damage. Uh, Bernie Fisher, who landed during the Battle of Ashaw and picked up a lad who had crashed no, uh, just off the runway. He had, I forget what, 20 or 30 bullet holes through that thing. While the USAF was trudging forward in Vietnam with the Sky Raider, Colonel K, an advocate for close support aircraft, found himself in a new office with a clandestine mission. Colonel Avery K. He wound up in 1966 in an office, a staff office to the chief of staff of the Air Force at the Pentagon headquarters called Concepts and Doctrine. Concepts and Doctrine was a smokescreen. What it really was about was a, a term of art in the military called roles and missions. What roles and missions means is your job is to defend the Air Force budget against raids by the Army and by the Navy. At the time, the U.S. Army was in development of a costly new helicopter called the Cheyenne. It was built for the mission that the USAF detested, close support. 50% more than the Air Force's most expensive fighter, the F-4, Kay recognized that the Cheyenne was a threat to the Air Force's budget. He also saw an opportunity to leverage the situation to fulfill the Air Force's old promise to the Army. He realized, you know, if the Army does this, if the Army builds this super expensive four and a half million dollar helicopter, they're going to want a thousand of them at least. Where's the money going to come from? It's going to come out of the Air Force budget. Perfectly correct perception. He also perceived that this would be a powerful incentive for the Chief of Staff to develop a close support airplane to make sure that the Army didn't get all that money. Kay's plan of creating a close support aircraft to thwart the Cheyenne filtered its way up to the Chief of Staff of the time, John P. McConnell. Though McConnell was a bomber general and loathed the close support mission, he had fears about relinquishing it to the Army. If you let the Army get away with that Cheyenne helicopter, you know, that costs 50% more than our most expensive fighter, that money's going to come out of your hide and you're going to go down history as the chief of staff who gave up the close support mission. Of course, no chief of staff wants to do that. They're all very worried about their legacy. March on, start developing a close support airplane, make sure it's cheaper than the Cheyenne, and make sure it's much more lethal and much more survivable so that we have a real case that the money should go to our airplane. Given the green light to create the USAF's first purpose-built close support plane, Colonel K had to build the brain trust that would help shape the aircraft's specifications. At the time, Pierre Spray was working for Secretary of Defense McNamara, analyzing the USAF's aircraft inventory in Europe. I've been assigned to do, are we wasting our money on airplanes in Europe? Are we doing the right thing? Are we buying the right fighters to stop 90 or 100 divisions of Soviets? from sweeping over you know, that was the number one threat in the U.S. military strategy at that point. My conclusion was, we are wasting our money. We need to stop buying so many bombing airplanes. At that time, it was called interdiction. We need to focus on close support, on actually helping our defending tank troops and anti-armor and so on with airplanes that can do the job right at the point of battle. That made me public enemy number one of the Air Force instantly. Realizing he had found a like-minded maverick in Pierre Spray, Colonel Kay approached him about joining his team. He says, Mr. Spray, I've read your paper. 
Uh, I see that you're a big supporter of close support and you think we should be spending lots more money on it. I've been assigned through my boss and the chief of staff has approved that we start a great close support airplane. He says, I'm stuck because the entire Air Force is sabotaging me. The rest of them don't want to do it, just the chief of staff. And we badly need help. We have no real technical people. Will you help us? There was no way in conscience that I could turn him down. It was such an absolutely correct thing to do and so badly needed. I said, I'll help you in any way I can. To help Spray and Colonel K develop the ultimate close support aircraft, they enlisted the help of A-1 pilots fresh out of Vietnam. Their first-hand experience working with the Army would prove invaluable in creating the new aircraft, then simply known as AX. Tom Christie, who helped examine potential contenders for the AX's weaponry, recalls the passion of Kay's group. And so I can remember coming up to Washington TDY from Eglin Air Force Base, which I did quite often, and uh, meeting with Pierre Spray, uh, you know, eight or nine o'clock at night in the Pentagon, and I'd show up and he'd have uh, five or six Air Force officers, you know, that were part of this cabal. Uh, and the one in particular that I remember was a guy that named Avery K. And they wanted to make sure that the Air Force did not go wandering off and make the same mistakes they'd made in previous years. They wanted an aircraft that was dedicated to and designed for close air support. The, the interesting thing is you would have imagined that an airplane born in this kind of sin, uh, you know, designed to simply kill an army helicopter, couldn't possibly become a good airplane. But the interesting thing is for us, down in the trenches, trying to shape this airplane, once we had the chief of staff's approval, is these were absolutely ideal circumstances for creating a really good airplane at very low cost. I mean, normally you're, you're told, include this technology, you gotta include that radar, you gotta include this piece of junk, make sure it's plenty expensive so that the contractors get lots of money. You know, whatever you do, don't make it cheaper than the last airplane. So those, that's what really shapes airplanes today. We have the dead opposite, because our instructions were make the airplane much more lethal, much more obviously lethal than the Cheyenne helicopter, make it much cheaper, and make it much more survivable. That's exactly what you want to do for a close support airplane. So out of the political mayhem of the Pentagon budget battles, we actually had marching instructions that, you know, the designers would kill for. Pierre Spray, Tom Christie, and Chuck Myers all pushed for the development of America's first close support plane. In the 1970s, these renegades would bond into a group known as the Fighter Mafia. Together with other like-minded officers and defense analysts, they battled against the establishment to help create the best aircraft to meet the demands of war within the restraints of the government's purse. Though they had their critics, more often than not, the fighter mafia were proven to be right. Spray worked closely with contractors, including Northrop and Fairchild, and reviewed hundreds of designs in the quest to make the ultimate close support plane. But what exactly are the ingredients of such an aircraft? The primary things you have to have, you have to be able to maneuver very well at low speed, and that's both to get close to the target so you can distinguish friends from enemies, you can pick up things that the ground guys can't see, and very important, particularly since some of this focus was on Europe, you have to be able to fly under weather. When you've got clouds at a thousand feet, 500 knot jets become hopeless. You have clouds at a thousand feet and you have hills that are 500 feet high, and you try to come booming down through those clouds at 500 knots, that's simply not feasible. The aircraft also needed to be capable of loitering over targets for extended periods, at least two and hopefully four hours with a full bomb load, 250 miles from base. If a plane had to leave the battle to refuel after just a few short minutes, it wouldn't be around long enough to provide any real support. The A-1 pilots were adamant about this, and about the need for an excellent radio communication system. 
you had to have great communications. This was in a day, and by the way, that day extends to today, when essentially no Air Force airplane could talk to the ground. They had radios that deliberately could only talk to other Air Force airplanes or to headquarters or to Air Force radar airplanes, and no direct way to talk to a guy, you know, holding a small tactical radio sitting in the foxhole. My A-1 guys were so insistent on that, they just pounded it into me every day. You can give up anything else, don't give up those radios. That's how important they were. Another key element of poor support aircraft is survivability. Pilots going on such a treacherous mission, close to enemy fire, need to have a reasonable chance of coming back in one piece. You can't ask pilots to go into an environment this dangerous to airplanes if you can't guarantee them that they're going to, you know, for the most part, get home. And so we put a huge amount of work into survivability. There was uh, so much attention paid to uh, the aircraft being able to survive in what was forecast to be a very uh, uh, critical environment that we were going to be flying in with a lot of air defenses. In particular, the 23 millimeter gun system that the Soviets allegedly were fielding in great numbers. You know, you put a 22 rifle into any modern jet, a 22 rifle bullet into any modern jet, and it will penetrate the tank, will very likely create a leak or light a fire, and the leak itself will catch on fire if it's right next to the engine. Well, a lot of attention, uh, uh, unprecedented attention, was paid to that whole concept of reducing the vulnerable areas being given a hit, will you go down or not? A plethora of survivability specifications were laid out for the AX. Using cables rather than flammable hydraulics to control the flaps and other control surfaces, and building the structure of the aircraft the old-fashioned way, with spars covered by skin. A feature that allowed the old A1s to return home with gaping holes in their wings. But perhaps the greatest feature of the AX was, of all things, a titanium bathtub. We demanded armor, essentially completely around the pilot, certainly up to, up to this level, from the front, the back, and everywhere, that would stop an American 50 caliber bullet or the Russian equivalent. And that led to a 2,000 pound titanium bathtub. They still call it the bathtub to this day, and the pilots love it, because it gives them all kinds of confidence when they're pressing an attack and they're hearing impacts of bullets on the airplane and so on. As important as survivability was, the AX was an offensive weapon built to destroy tanks. The whole of the aircraft was designed around a massive gun capable of blowing away the competition. While designing the gun specs, Spray looked for inspiration from a most unusual source, a hero of Nazi Germany. During the Gulf War, an aircraft previously unwanted became the most valuable member of the American arsenal, the Fairchild Republic A-10 Thunderbolt II. More than the publicity, uh, the weapon system was really vindicated because it, it was a proof of concept that people that were associated with the airframe uh, knew that it could do the job, but not a lot of other people did, especially some of the senior Air Force leadership. And it was, it was very rewarding to go out and, and uh, kick butt. We, we probably took a lot of heat from all our friends in, in the Air Force and Navy and other airplanes because it's slow, it's ugly. You know, they like to uh, rib us about that, but the reason it was so successful in the, in the Gulf War is that um, look, it's not really about looks or about speed, it's about firepower. I and mean, the A-10 can really deliver a lot of ordnance in a very precise manner. The A-10 basically is a gun that they decided to make fly. The rate of fire of our gun is around 3,900 rounds per minute, or about 50 to 70 rounds per second as the gun comes up to speed. That does not sound like a machine gun. Uh, that sounds like a, a very unhappy lion or tiger or beast of some sort because it, it, it has a roaring sound. When the time came to name this intimidating airplane, only one beast came to mind. Now, obviously, when the A-10 follows 
a long, a long line of distinguished hogs, someone had to come up with a hog-like name for this airplane. And, and looking at it, the obvious hog-like name for an airplane that's this ugly would be the warthog. I think its mission of uh, ground attack uh, brought on some of that. You know, it's uh, down and dirty in the mud, like a warthog. After its rousing success in the Gulf War, few remain unfamiliar with America's warthog. During the war, hog pilots flew 8,100 sorties, destroyed more than half of the Iraqi armor and artillery, assisted in search and rescue missions, hunted scuds, and often operated in the darkness of night. The airplane's remarkable durability and the hard work of Air Force pilots and mechanics enable the Warthog to operate with a mission capability rate of an astonishing 96%. And in a tribute to its toughness, only six of the 144 Warthogs deployed to the Gulf were lost. The Warthog is one of the most formidable airplanes in the history of aviation. Although this highly maneuverable airplane can carry a remarkable 16,000 pounds of mixed ordnance, it is the massive 30 millimeter Avenger cannon which places the Warthog in a class of its own. The Avenger can fire 70 rounds a second and is the largest gun ever put into a fighter airplane, capable of killing tanks, trains, boats, or anything else that gets in its way. With an impressive mixture of agility, rugged toughness, and devastating firepower, the A-10 stands as one of the world's great planes. In a sight becoming more common throughout the American military, a complementary mixture of full-time Air Force personnel and Air National Guardsmen combined to keep planes like the Warthog in a constant state of readiness. Bob and I are both crew chiefs in the Maryland Air National Guard. We're responsible, our unit's responsible for maintaining 17 A-10 aircraft. Bob's a full-time member of the Guard, and I'm a traditional Guardsman. When I'm not at the Guard on my one weekend a month, I'm a Baltimore City police officer. On a typical Saturday, we'll come in about 6.30 in the morning. I'll stay till about six o'clock at night. Usually we'll fly 10, 10 airplanes to land again, send up 10 more. In the hangar right now, they have a, there's four airplanes in there. One they're using for load crew training. One, I believe they're doing some sort of flight control maintenance on. And the two in the far rear are both down for phase inspections. All right, this airplane right now is in the, uh, is in the phase inspection, which is accomplished every 400 hours flying hours that has come in for a major inspection. And during that inspection, they basically open the entire airplane up. And in doing that, they inspect uh, the front compartments, the, uh, the gun get ins gets inspection, the engines get inspected, the wings, the gears, you have to, um, special inspections that have to be done, TCTOs, and basically gets an overall look at everything. Okay, part of the um, A-10 and phase inspection process is the armors. They've taken this gun out and inspected the gun bay, and now they are in the process of preparing to put the gun back in. Our primary function is to remain combat ready. In other words, to train to the same level of proficiency as our active duty counterparts, such that if the level of tasking and the level of involvement of our uh, Air Force reached the point where it couldn't be completely handled by our active duty units, then the Guard and Reserve is ready to fill in, and fill in on very short notice. Uh, usually on a uh, drill weekend, or a UTA we call it, uh, we put together a scenario for the day, a mini war for a day, and we have intel, we coordinate with intel and all the different shops, and we go out and basically execute a war plan for that for one day. With the recent downsizing of the active duty Air Force, Units like the 175th Wing of the Maryland Air National Guard have become integral participants in any mission undertaken by the Air Force. About 25% of the 175th Wing are full-time employees of the Maryland Air National Guard. The remaining members, traditional guardsmen, leave their families and employers for training one weekend a month and also to serve 15 days or more of active duty each year. This is, of course, an Air National Guard unit made up of uh, 
primarily prior service pilots that came out of uh, active duty units and moved on to a civilian occupation. And in many cases, that civilian occupation was the airlines. And they fly two aircraft now. They have their civilian jobs uh, with their civilian airlines, and they come in on weekends and some off times during the week to, um, uh, to fly this airplane. Amongst the proud and select group who call themselves hog pilots, one stands alone. Lieutenant Colonel Ron Henry, who's been flying the airplane since its introduction into the Air Force, is the only hog pilot who have amassed more than 4,000 hours of flight time in the A-10. Nicknamed the professor for his academic and meticulous approach to his job, Henry's invaluable experience and insight have helped countless younger pilots master their craft. I was a volunteer for this assignment back in 1977. Uh, the airplane was brand new. Every airplane that enters the inventory has a certain steep associated with it. Uh, and in 1977, the A-10 was introduced at Myrtle Beach Air Force Base, South Carolina. In the combination of Myrtle Beach Air Force Base and a brand new airframe made it the most desirable assignment in the United States Air Force in the late 70s. And there was no problem getting people to volunteer for this airplane. I can't understand why there ever would be. I have seen the airplane evolve over a period of 20 years. I started flying this airplane in 1977 and it's changed quite a bit. It was a very simple, austere airplane in its early days. It was designed that way, uh, designed to cost very, very little. But uh, the airplane has proved so survivable and so indestructible that uh, the mission has evolved and the complexity of the airplane has increased over time. Uh, when we first started flying the airplane, we had uh, basically three radios and a, a navigational receiver, and that's really all we had. We had no computers on board to help us uh, guide the airplane or help us aim the weapons. Quite a bit of money has been spent on the airplane since its uh, uh, introduction to the fleet in terms of retrofitting the airplane. We now have a uh, very capable air-to-ground computing system that helps us aim our weapons. It helps us aim not only the 30 millimeter cannons, but also all the gravity weapons that fall off the bomb. Good enough to, uh, to win uh, the Air Force's uh, biannual uh, gunnery competition in 1991. What I like most about the Guard is that we can just continue to fly as line pilots until we're 55 years old, an opportunity you usually don't have in the active duty. Uh, we, we enjoy flying, obviously, more than anything in our career, uh, and that's why we joined the Guard. Affection and enthusiasm for flying the Warthog makes the rigorous training seem less demanding than it is. Hog pilots can ill afford to be unprepared for the challenging missions the A-10 must perform and keeping the unit ready is a full-time occupation. We train continuously, not just on weekends. We run a flying operation here four to five days a week, and with the luxury of an airline schedule, many of our pilots can come in and fly several times a week if they wish, and we can maintain the same level of proficiency. In the past two years, Many of these Maryland Guardsmen have twice left their families and full-time jobs to assist NATO forces in Bosnia. Despite the serious nature of their service, these hog pilots feel their affection for the warthog helps them keep things in perspective.
I think we're a little bit more casual and, and uh, not as threatened about our ego per se, but uh, uh, it's a single seat airplane. So you get to fly it by yourself. You don't have to talk to anybody else to what you're doing. We always fly in two or four aircraft and we're, we train routinely at low altitude, 500 feet or uh, you can go lower in certain areas. And that's, you know, moving around at 300 knots, that's a lot of fun. Flying the hog is, and it's got to be as fun as any fighter to fly. It's single seat. It's a, a, a VFR mission, which means uh, you don't have to fly on predetermined routes. Uh, you can navigate with much more freedom. And it's it's just a great deal of fun. I think it's uh, the most enjoyable type of tactical flying I could ever hope to do. In January 1973, the Fairchild Republic Corporation unveiled the airplane the Air Force and the Army desperately wanted, the A-10 Thunderbolt II. It was not a pretty sight, but it was exactly what the military needed. The conflict in Vietnam had painfully illustrated the need for a new aircraft to handle the difficult task of close air support, a role the A-10 was methodically designed to perform. This task is one of the most difficult in all of aviation. The Warthog must loiter around the battlefield while providing support for ground forces and destroying enemy tanks, vehicles, and artillery. And this job must be performed at low altitudes under heavy enemy fire. That's why this airplane is so ugly. This airplane is optimized to perform the close air support mission. It's designed to fly slower than most. Slower because it's necessary to keep the good guys and the bad guys in sight if you're gonna deliver ordnance in close proximity to those good guys. The A-10 evolved from lessons learned in Vietnam but it was in reality designed to provide close air support in Europe. The A-10, with its tank-killing ability, stood as an integral part of NATO's strategy to match the threat of Soviet tanks, stood poised to storm across Germany. Forty years earlier, the Germans had unleashed upon the world the power of close air support. By the summer of 1939, Germany's resurrection into a military power was complete. The Nazi regime combined a huge, highly mechanized army with a devastating fleet of 4,000 all-metal aircraft. Hitler's Air Force, the Luftwaffe, pushed the envelope of war into a terrifying new era. The strategy behind the design of the Luftwaffe was close air-to-ground support. A strategy unveiled with terrifying precision during the Nazis' invasion of Poland. In a pattern destined to be repeated throughout Europe, the Luftwaffe soared ahead of Hitler's highly mechanized army and pounded enemy troops, artillery, and aircraft. Within 10 months, Europe had collapsed into the iron fist of the Nazis, a testament to the brutal effectiveness of their military machine. <laughs> In the wake of the German victories and the emerging threat from Japan, American airplane manufacturers began designing and manufacturing airplanes at an extraordinary rate. Of all the American fighters from World War II, one simply stands alone, Republic's P-47 Thunderbolt. More than 15,600 P-47s were manufactured, more than any other Allied fighter from World War II. Nicknamed the Jug, the Thunderbolt was the largest of all the Allied single-engine fighters and weighed an astonishing eight tons. Armed with 850 caliber machine guns, the Thunderbolt presented a formidable force. Driven by a 13-foot propeller and a 2,300-horsepower Pratt & Whitney engine, the P-47 was the fastest U.S. fighter 
and could reach speeds of 428 miles per hour. With a range of more than 1,000 miles and a cruising speed of 350 miles per hour, the P-47 starred throughout the war as an invaluable escort for bombers and as an integral support airplane for Allied ground forces. Along with planes like the North American P-51 Mustang, the P-47 provided vital Allied support for the Normandy invasion, repelling German troops and weaponry which defended the shores of France. Coordination of troop movements in sync with aerial support was crucial to the success of the Normandy invasion. On D-Day alone, more than 14,000 sorties were flown by the Allies in preparation and support of the initial invasion. The Allies learned the lesson of close air support quickly, and the legendary P-47 Thunderbolt helped bring the Allies victory in Europe and in the Pacific. After World War II and in the wake of the tremendous success of the original Thunderbolt, the Republic Corporation began developing the lineage of jet airplanes which led to the Warthog. Republic's first F-84 Thunderjets were straight-wing jet airplanes, which were armed with 6.50 caliber machine guns, had a range of nearly 1,500 miles, and a maximum speed of 620 miles per hour. The first prototype flew in early 1946. These F-84s were the original hogs, nicknamed as such because on hot days, the airplane would often struggle to get off the ground and would sometimes tip over, leaving their stout noses rooted in the mud. Thus, the first hog was born. All told, more than 3,300 of the original hogs were built, serving throughout the 1950s and into the 60s. Republic continually upgraded the Hawk, and in 1952, they produced a swept-wing version, known as the F-84F Thunderstreak. The legacy of the Hogs continued when pilots christened the Super Hog. The Super Hog, capable of a speed of 685 miles per hour and a range of 1,650 miles, soon developed into an integral member of the U.S. Air Force. It could carry a variety of rockets and bombs, and Republic built more than 2,700 Super Hogs. The F-105 Thunder Chief, introduced in 1956, demonstrated that Republic was not going to rest easy after the success of the F-84, and it did not take long for the F-105 to be given a hog name of its own. As the F-105 was introduced, the previous F-84 pilots who transitioned into the F-105 looked at their very sophisticated Cadillac airplane and thought of it as the Ultra Hog, and the 105 became known as the Ultra Hog. Capable of speeds in excess of 1,200 miles per hour and a range of 2,000 miles, the Ultra Hog demonstrated the rapid evolution of the jet from an imperfect machine to a sleek vehicle with power, range, and firepower. Designed as a high-speed interceptor, this large fighter bomber was armed with a GE M61 Vulcan 20mm gun and could carry Sidewinder missiles. The Ultra Hog could also carry nuclear warheads in its bomb bay, and ultimately, nearly 900 F 105s were built. The final hog in Republic's proud lineage evolved from the American experience in Vietnam. The war fought against a desperate and determined people in a climate brutally hostile to man and machine pushed both to their limits. 
in the battlefields of the harsh humid jungle, troop support was a foremost concern for the American military. Helicopters quickly proved their merit in this role, and the Huey paved the way for armed close air support. Although helicopters retained a mobility advantage over the fixed-wing aircraft, the firepower and speed offered by airplanes such as the A-1 Sky Raider led many to believe a new fixed-wing aircraft was needed to fill the role of close air support. The uh, A1E Sky Raider really uh, illustrated a need for a uh, aircraft that was maneuverable, close to the ground, close to the bad guys, where you could look out the window and see what you were attacking to differentiate between the friendlies and the bad guys in a, uh, a very reliable manner. Fairchild Republic delivered the first production model of the A-10A to davis monthan Air Force Base in October of 1975. The suggestion that the plane be called the Warthog in honor of Republic's hog lineage and given the ugliness of the airplane did not sit well with the brass of the Air Force. The plane was officially named the A-10 Thunderbolt II in honor of the legendary performance of the original Thunderbolt in World War II. But to its pilots, and ultimately to anyone familiar with it, this airplane has only one name but it's a very affectionate name. No Warthog pilot is ashamed to call his airplane the Warthog. The A-10 basically is a gun that they decided to make fly. It's a 30 millimeter, seven barrel Gatling gun, shoots at 4,200 rounds per minute, and they bolted wings, a fuel tank, a pilot, some engines on it, and it goes out shooting at tanks and any other uh, targets of opportunities. Um, this is a 30 millimeter round. It's a training round. It's been polished for the presentation round, but this is the size of the actual round. The projectile is up here. You can see 30 millimeters is the, is the width, the diameter of the projectile. And as you can see, it's quite a large round. It weighs about one and a half pounds per round. And our planes carry 1,150 rounds of this. To give you some idea how long the gun system is. The gun barrels actually end here. And the gun barrels start about here. The gun rotor is in this area. Hydraulic drive mechanism, the two drive motors are here, and the ammunition drum starts about here and extends all the way back to here. And as you can see, everything from the forward of the, of the wing is devoted almost entirely to the gun system. The pilot's floorboards are actually the mounting surfaces of some of the gun structure. And with the exception of the electronic controls and the battery, almost everything is the gun. When the Air Force drew up the specifications for the plane, they wanted the capability to kill tanks. Early on in the design process, Fairchild Republic decided a 30 millimeter Gatling gun would be the ideal weapon of choice. But the sheer size of the 20-foot GEGAU 8A Avenger cannon presented a design problem, for which there was only one solution. Design the plane around the gun. The Avenger is a seven-barrel, 30-millimeter cannon, which delivers a frightening burst of destruction. The gun fires shells, which are a foot long and weigh nearly two pounds. Fully loaded, the gun weighs two tons. Well, the gun's a 30-millimeter. It's uh, the largest gun, you know, in an airplane. Uh, well, a fighter-type airplane. There's some transports that carry bigger guns, but uh, it's, it's very precise. Such precision allows hog pilots to hit targets up to two miles away. And with a muzzle velocity of 3,450 feet per second, the gun can fire an average of nearly 70 rounds per second. One shot can destroy a tank. Projectile itself is exceedingly uh, 
lethal uh, in its um, anti-armor form, the armor-piercing incendiary, a very small slug of depleted uranium is actually what's delivered on target. And it uh, strikes the target with uh, almost 12 times the kinetic energy of, the, of its uh, predecessor 20 millimeter round. Uh, even though it's only 50% larger in linear dimension, it has 12 times the kinetic energy on the target. The tremendous recoil force of the gun led to its positioning slightly offset to port, so that the firing barrel is exactly on the center line. This avoids the problem of asymmetric recoil forces. It produces as much recoil as the engines produce in forward thrust. Theoretically, if you uh, had the ammunition and could hold the trigger down long enough, the airplane would come to a complete stop because the gun would win the tug of war. The 19,000 pounds of recoil forces dictate that the Avenger is usually fired only in short bursts of about two seconds, an exercise which also avoids ammunition wastage and barrel overheating. Despite its incredible power, the gun is by no means the only threat the Warthog poses to enemy forces. Uh, the A-10 is, uh, is an attack airplane, and that's a uh, euphemism for bomber. It does primarily drag bombs around the sky, uh, although we tend to uh, employ the gun whenever possible because the gun does give us the option of standing off from the target, sending ordnance a mile, a mile and a half downrange, and then actually departing the target area without having to overfly the target. However, the airplane can carry up to uh, 16,000 pounds of uh, releasable external stores. And that I think you'll find if you check your history books is uh, about four times what a World War II B-17 could carry. The A-10 carries its massive load of 16,000 pounds of mixed ordnance on eight underwing and three under fuselage pylon stations. These 11 heart points allow the A-10 to be armed according to the task at hand. This right here is a ECM-184 pod. It's an electronic jamming device. This is a uh, Mark 82. This right here is a uh, cluster bomb. A variety of armaments available to the Warthog is extensive, including AGM-114 Hellfire anti-tank missiles, Sidewinder missiles, and a selection of both smart and dumb bombs. Although we carry dumb bombs or unguided bombs, uh, we have a, a state-of-the-art delivery system, what's called CCIP, uh, consciously computed impact point. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to deliver stupid bombs or dumb bombs uh, with great precision. But the uh, typical combat loadout of the airplane then would include the 30 millimeter cannon and almost 1,200 rounds of 30 millimeter ammunition, plus six bombs, um, an assortment of Maverick missiles, the air-to-air -air missile, which uh, we carry, the AIM-9 Sidewinder missile, which we carry for self-defense. Armed to the teeth, few can challenge the firepower of the Warthog. The airplane, it is, has often been said, uh, and more often uh, as a form of criticism rather than praise, that this is the only airplane that the Air Force ever bought that was designed to take hits, not avoid hits. And it's quite true. The airplane was designed to, to take hits and absorb damage and survive. Every aspect of the Warthog can be traced to the simple concept that the airplane had to survive its grueling mission.
and the A-10 was designed with several thousand pounds of uh, titanium steel surrounding critical flight components, one of which of course is the pilot. And this was a, an intentional design decision on the part of the designers wherein they were willing to sacrifice fuel or, or ordnance load in favor of survivability. Reinforced with nearly 3,000 pounds of titanium armor plating, the Warthog can survive direct hits from armor piercing and high explosive projectiles up to 23 millimeters. 1,200 pounds of the titanium surrounds the cockpit, enveloping the pilot in what is commonly referred to as a titanium bathtub. This bathtub of one and a half inch armor gives Hog pilots added security as they undertake their dangerous missions. One of the features that gives the Warthog its undeniably unique profile is the placement of its engines. The A-10 had to have two engines for survivability. Fortunately, during the early stages of development, the designers found out that GE was working on turbofan engines for a new Navy anti-submarine aircraft. Turbofans had made inroads into civilian aircraft, but had not been much use in the military sphere. These engines held several advantages, which made them an excellent choice for the A-10. They offered high fuel efficiency, and they were less noisy than turbojets, and had a lower heat signature. Once the designers chose the type of engine, another issue arose, where to put them. The area under the wing was reserved for the heavy ordnance load. Eventually, the area near the back of the fuselage proved the best location, and placing the engines there also offered a number of advantages. It negated a potential yaw, decreased the probability that foreign objects might be sucked into the engines, and removed the engines from the major flow of the exhaust from the gun. The forward fuselage and wings also shield the engines from ground fire in the frontal section, and the vertical fins and rudder guard the engine's heat signature from the side, alleviating some of the aircraft's vulnerability to heat-seeking missiles. The Warthog's toughness is compounded by a number of structural and system redundancies. The dual redundancy of the hydraulic flight control systems is also backed up by a manual system. This enables Hog pilots to fly and land even if hydraulic power is lost. The Warthog's extraordinarily high mission capability rate during the Gulf War directly resulted from a design dedicated to ensuring the plane could be serviced and operated from bases with limited facilities close to the battlefield. Many of the A-10's parts, including the engines, main landing gear, tails, and vertical stabilizers, are interchangeable left to right. Interchanging as well as cannibalizing parts between aircraft is a standard maintenance procedure, one used with much success during Desert Storm. Uh, the shape of the airplane, uh, the fact that it's battlefield repairable with very simple surfaces, was all built into the airplane because the designers realized this airplane is probably going to take a hit. The mission of the Warthog is such that hits are inevitable, and there have been and will be instances when the pilot must abandon his hog to save himself. The well, export superintendent here at the Maryland Air National Guard, and part of my job is to ensure that pilots can remain safe while flying, but also in case of an emergency they have to eject, that we supply them with survival gear to ensure their survivability on the ground. And part of that gear that we would pack in their kits is provided here on the board behind me on display. And a couple of those items. First, outside of a, a large kit, we have two small kits that are contained inside. And inside these small kits would be the items that we have shown on the wall. And let me point a couple of those out. 
Obviously, we have the mittens and stocks, both of wool, used for wintertime warmth. Obviously not a problem now. Got your knife, which is one of your, your basic utensils in survival. And we have container to hold water. Water is one of your primary needs in a survival situation. And we do supply many packets of the flexible drinking water there with them. You do have food, but that is not as important as water. We also have probably getting into the most regarding rescue would be the flares, which we have the handheld launching flares. We have other flares here to direct rescue aircraft in to pick up that pilot. And as soon as that pilot would eject and hit the ground, his survival radio. Very important to talk to other aircraft in the air to let them know what his situation is, and also to talk to rescue to direct them to his location. Part of the A-10's mission is to fly low to the ground to get close air support to the troops there. So naturally this is going to put them in harm's way, leave them open to gunfire, missiles, and so forth. So the A-10 pilot probably finds himself in, in more jeopardy than, than the fast flyers flying at much higher altitudes. It's important that these items be there. Now it it's something that a part of our training, or a lot of our time is spent in training the pilot for something he may never need. However, it, should he need it, he needs to know that it is there and it will work and fortunately could save his life. You know, we got uh, the latest and greatest equipment that we can have out there, and it's constantly being upgraded. Most of ours are 78, 79 version models out here. And so that's a pretty good long time for an airplane to be in service, and it's constantly being modified, and it's got a lot of capability. Unproven in battle, much of the Air Force brass did not think of the Warthog as an integral part of the post-Cold War strategy until the winds of war swept across the deserts of Kuwait. You know, the mission changed a few years ago before we were looking at a high threat scenario in Eastern Europe and then uh, with the change in the political climate. Many doubted whether the Warthog could adapt to the new missions of the post-Cold War era. But the Warthog rose to the challenge and, during the Gulf War, served brilliantly in a variety of roles. Despite only flying 30% of the sorties, the A-10 was responsible for more than 50% of the confirmed bomb damage. And only six airplanes and two pilots were lost, a remarkable rate considering the danger of the missions. Given the heavy use of the airplane, it did not take long for the Iraqis to become all too familiar with the Warthog. It was a quote from one uh, captured Iraqi who said that um, it was the most feared airplane. I, I think largely because we spent a lot of time over the troops, over the army, you know, where some of the other airplanes were attacking strategic targets, buildings and bridges. Uh, maybe the troops didn't have as much uh, exposure to, to those airplanes, but they saw the A-10 and they were never quite sure what, it, what uh, target we were going to choose, so, you know, there's some concern on their parts being down below, not knowing uh, we had when and where it's coming. We had 144 airplanes stationed over there, and it was 24 operations. We had two night squadrons and five uh, squadrons on the, uh, on the day schedule, and we just totally saturated the air with A-10s, you know, 25 miles deep. So that's all they saw continuously, and if you can imagine sitting on the ground wondering if you're the next target, it was a big psychological game that uh, was and listening to the gun, the gun makes a, a real, I don't know if you've ever heard it, but it makes a great roar and it echoes and you can hear it for quite a way. And having to listen to that uh, hour after hour, day after day, I'm sure it took its toll on them.
since the Golf, the, the major change to the A10 has been uh, night vision goggles. They've redone all of our instrument panels and the uh, consoles to make it well, night vision compatible. So now pretty much we do everything we did uh, in the Golf in, at day, at night now, which is pretty much double the capabilities of the airplane. With the A-10's role in the Air Force cemented well into the 21st century, the Air Force and the Air National Guard will continue to keep the Warthog combat ready, demonstrating a successful adaptation by the military in a changing era. Units such as the 175th Fighter Group must remain ready to take the Warthog wherever it may be needed and must be ready to serve side by side with the active duty units. So far, they've done so without exception. Uh, we have, in recent months, undertaken the same tasking that our active duty squadrons have undertaken. We have been to uh, the European theater to support the operation in Bosnia over Bosnia. We had guard units deployed to the Persian Gulf and performed admirably. I mean, there was little to no difference between there was. I, 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 must, I must brag to some extent. There was no difference between their performance and the performance of, of the active duty units there. Once deemed too slow, too simple, and too ugly to be of much value, the A-10 Thunderbolt II now stands as one of the world's undeniable great planes. Its outstanding maneuverability, deadly firepower, and legendary toughness are testaments to a successful design concept. The pride and affection felt by hog pilots and crewmen for their airplane, unrivaled. For these soldiers, it was merely a matter of time before the world recognized the greatness of the extraordinary airplane with the unforgettable name. The P-47 Thunderbolt earned its reputation as a rugged workhorse of the United States Army Air Force in World War II, striking down close to 4,000 enemy aircraft on more than 700,000 sorties. The success of this aircraft would solidify the status of Republic Aviation as a leader in aircraft manufacture and design, and ignite the career of its chief engineer, Alexander Cartvelli. Carvelli, whose genius helped create the P-47, would shape a generation of ever more advanced aircraft, from the F-84 Thunderjet, to the F-105 Thunderjet, to the A-10 Thunderbolt II. Dr. Robert Sanator, a protege of Carvelli, was witness to this golden age at Republic as he worked his way up from designer to company president. In an exclusive interview, Dr. Sanator pays homage to the legacy of Alexander Carvelli and the aircraft he conceived for Republic. My first job at the Republic Aviation, 1951, was as a junior engineer, which is an entry position for uh, young engineering graduates. And what responsibilities did you have? Very little. Mostly it was working under the supervision of others, and I began my career in the aerodynamics department. Republic was a great place to be. It was uh, staffed with uh, incredibly smart 
in fact, brilliant people in all aspects of the uh, running of the business. It was led by strong people who gathered around them the best it was uh, in America. And uh, I learned a lot. I learned everything from the people I worked with over the years. I should say this, that at the time period of um, when I started there, it was uh, filled with opportunity. It is different than today. There were many aviation companies in existence, and each of them had many projects. Uh, when I went to Republic in 1951, there were six active aircraft programs in B. So a person had the opportunity uh, to learn a lot about the different airplanes, to participate, and to really do engineering or whatever kind of work you wanted to do. There were many, many opportunities. Um, I worked on every one of those airplanes in the first year that I was there, from the uh, XF-91 to the straight-wing F-84s to the uh, F-105 to the XF-103. Um, and the swept-wing versions of the F-84. I count them as about six programs that were moving simultaneously. There is no such thing that I know of today, and there certainly aren't very many aircraft companies uh, around in the, the U.S. today. So in my own case, uh, within being there about six months, uh, I was asked to, of all things, to go and uh, get some wind tunnel testing done down at what was then NACA, is now NASA in Langley Field, in their seven by 10 foot tunnel of what became the uh, XF-84H, which was a turboprop uh, F-84. And there were some things that we needed to learn about uh, how to fly that airplane, so to get its aerodynamic characteristics. And I was given that opportunity to work with the NASA and NACA engineers, do the testing, collect all the data, and analyze what kind of uh, flying qualities this machine would have. Major D. Seversky, as many people know, uh, was a Russian. He was a pilot, and uh, he flew uh, combat work in the uh, First World War. He uh, was involved in, I think, an explosion of some kind on the, in the airplane and uh, lost his leg. Nevertheless, um, even with his wooden leg, De Seversky um, still proved to, uh, to his uh, superiors that he was a combat pilot. So I think that tells you something about an individual. The, uh, and so I admired that uh, in him. After the war, he started work with, I think, the SEV-3, which was an amphibian airplane. That was the uh, forerunner of all of the uh, Seversky airplanes that later became Republic airplanes, the P-35, the P-43, and ultimately the Thunderbolt, P-47. Seversky was out of that uh, picture. That was Cartvelli. Cartvelli started to work with Major D. Seversky sometime in the late 1920s. But of course, the company was formed in 1931, the Seversky, and uh, Alexander Cardvelli became the chief engineer and stayed with them. 1939, the company became Republic Aviation. Uh, Major D. Seversky was uh, um, taken out of his position because of uh, financial problems. Uh, and we moved on from there with the uh, different uh, derivatives. 
those airplanes up to the Thunderbolt P-47, which was led, that one and many other aircraft, by Alexander Kartov. What, what I can tell you about uh, Mr. Kartveli is that he had a very good technical background. So he was a good mathematician, and uh, yet um, a lot of it was feel. And it is, after all, engineering is an art. It is not a science. It is, at least I was trained in that concept, it is an art. Uh, if you stick only to the books and the numbers, you may not succeed. You need to have a feel of things. And he did. And he, but he relied on the best information he could get from his uh, supporting team to use that feel to make it work. Some of the things I remember hearing about from um, Mr. Cartvelli, or when the P-47 was put into service, it was clearly much bigger than the kind of aircraft that were flying there, such as uh, Spitfire. But it had certain characteristics that were very good. It had the ability to dive rapidly, to build up to very high speeds, so that if it got onto an enemy's tail and the enemy decided to dive, he would get very far because the P-47 was good at that. At Republic, right after the Second World War, there were a couple of directions that were being laid down. One was uh, trying to continue in the um, military aircraft field uh, with the straight wing F-84s. The other side of it was trying to compete in um, the commercial field. Two aircraft uh, designs were put forward, one called CB, which was an interesting little airplane with a pusher prop and able to operate amphibiously. When I was teenage, there was a radio host named Arthur Godfrey, and he talked about the CB, which got my attention. And so I tried to find out what this was about, and it was uh, designed to be built for the consumer market with the concept that uh, many people would be returning from uh, military flight and might want to fly these little airplanes. There was a target cost of about $3,500 per airplane, which today would sound uh, to be incredulous. Uh, I think if their final price was about $6,000. The other airplane was called XF-12, which later became known as the Rainbow. And this was a beautiful design a very, very streamlined airplane, 40 to 45 uh, passenger airplane that the uh, company was trying to offer to the Air Force. They then tried to sell it to the airlines and there were some people who were interested in it. It never got bought. The orders for the, um, that, that the company thought, that Republic thought, would be taken by Pan Am, TWA, others like that, did not materialize. So the project was dropped. On the military side, there was a great deal of activity on a whole family of F-84 aircraft, starting from the straight-wing F-84. At the same time, there was a XF-91 that used a lot of the components of the F-84 but put an inverse tapered wing of variable incidence. And the inverse tapered wing was designed in order to avoid what was called a saber dance, which was the F-100 saber having some problems with the tip stall. Um, 
that airplane was one of the first aircraft to go uh, supersonic or transonic to supersonic at sea level. It was, I think, the first. The airplane never went into production because it did not have the uh, range. At the same time, while these things were going on, the swept wing F-84s, both the F-84F, the RF-84, F, and other F-84, Thunder Streets and Thunder Flash and everything with thunder was in progress. And uh, while I was doing wind tunnel work on the XF-84H uh, at uh, Langley Field, um, there were these projects that were moving along. At the same time, the F-105 went into production in the early 1950s. So the time period is, over a period of several years, there were a large number of uh, things that grew out of the Thunder Jet. It was amazing to me how from the P-47, the company under the direction of Alexander Clark Valley was able to make such a rapid move into jet aircraft. Many projects very quickly after the end of the um, Second World War. And one thing that uh, Mr. Cardvelli always uh, insisted on was low drag streamlined ships. It had to be smooth, it had to look good. And his uh, opinions were that if it looked good, it would work well. So, uh, so they went from the Thunderbolt P-47 to a whole series of uh, aircraft with the um, prefix Thunder. The XF-103. Now this was a extremely novel concept. It was uh, an interceptor that would fly at uh, speeds in excess of Mach number 3.5. And it was a single place with a chin inlet for hypersonic speeds. And it would take the uh, turbojets that would convert to ramjets at high speed. Now that went to markup stage and uh, it had very, very thin wings, beautiful looking aircraft. Uh, one, f one designer said those wings are meant for shaving because they were so razor sharp, right? Uh, and it was a, basically a Delta platform. And I think, I think at the time it was uh, in competition for the, for the role of interceptor against the uh, 102. But as the years went by, we, uh, the program was canceled at Republic in 57 or 58, 1957, 1958. And what came out was something called A11, which became SR-71, the Blackbirds. And so that took the role of the uh, high altitude, high Mach number aircraft that the F-103 was moving toward. And of course, that was a black program. We never knew it existed, or at least I didn't. And uh, it was well understood why the 103 never uh, got legs. But I did wind tunnel work on the 103 in the early 50s, the usual aerodynamic characteristics and such. So that is the, uh, the breadth and extent of a large number of things that grew out of the uh, Thunder series. The F-105 was, as you would guess, was initially started out to be a nuclear weapon carrier. And uh, there was initially, in the early F-105s, a large Bombay that was built into the airplane to carry what we used to refer to in our engineering language as a special store. A special store was a nuclear-tipped piece of ordnance. Um, 
it was then determined somewhere along the line that this, of course, we never used it. Hope we never had to. And it was determined that really the F-105 uh, would not be required to do its initial mission, which was carrying the nuclear store internally. So it then got converted uh, into a ground attack airplane. And that large area that was in the bomb bay, which was called by many of our people the ballroom, because it was a big area, got utilized for other equipment. And the airplane went through a whole family of changes from the initial A's to the B's to the D's to the F's and what ultimately F conversion into G's the wild weasel. And there were a total of 833 F-105s that were built by Republic. Superb design, great airplane. It got a reputation for requiring long runways because of relatively low power. But when the J-75s, particularly the Dash 19 engine, uh, became available, a lot of that uh, disappeared. But it had still the reputation and so got the moniker of uh, Thud. But the Thud was a great airplane. I told you before about Todd Belly's feeling about smoothness, slenderness, streamlined shapes, and it was true. Things worked, and uh, Republic made some very fast airplanes. And I'll tell you two things. One, uh, during the F-105 uh, program, uh, Richard Whitcomb of NACA had developed what he called transonic area rule. And the F-105 required in order to satisfy the rule and make it go through the transonic speed zone more easily, what's known as a Coke bottle shape. Well, uh, when uh, Mr. Cardavelli heard of that, he would have none of it. But um, he says, we are not putting Coke bottles on my F-105. But um, turned out that when he saw the test data, changed his mind, and allowed the coke bottling to take place, although not totally as much as uh, uh, Richard Whitcomb suggested, but enough to do what it had to do. So he was able to step back from his beliefs when the facts proved them. And I think that's very important when you work with people. You're, you're, uh, next in line are allowed to be heard and they're not afraid to be heard and they know that if they're right sooner or later it will uh, come to pass i think the sad part of uh, republic's history was that the decision made by uh, secretary of defense mcnamara to uh, not purchased the next planned set of F-105s, but to use the Navy's F-4. And I think around 63 or 64, around that time, was uh, very unfortunate. It took a great company and uh, put it on its knees. Uh, They went then in 1965 to be purchased by uh, Fairchild and fundamentally were supporting the F-105s in the field and doing subcontract work. And they lost a lot of their people, but they fortunately retained enough to win the A-10 and to give them another chance at that. The uh, TFX competition, which became the F-111, we were in that. We're in that. We didn't win that. Possibly we didn't win that. Don't know why. Um, maybe the, the concept was that there were, you know, 
the F-105 was going to phase out, and then what were we going to do? So there were those years that the company just hung on and hung on and then was successful in uh, getting another chance at the A-10. I found that, that like many things in life, the, the object that wins the competition is not necessarily the best designed or the, or the logical winner. Mm -hmm. There are other aspects of the competition. That yes. Political being not the least of them. Oh, yes, and I think uh, uh, if we were to talk about uh, what causes an airplane to succeed with its customers or potential customers as opposed not to, as you uh, point out, there are um, many reasons, not necessarily which is the best design. And some of those reasons might be the uh, ability or, or ability of management to actually pull the job off. That's an important assessment factor. And um, it may well be political. There are all these things that come into it. Uh, our, our own belief at Republic during the F-15 program, um, and it's just our opinion. We don't know this to be a fact. But we had been told that we had a very good uh, F-15 proposal for its design work. And uh, I think the competition was running between uh, Republic and General Dynamics. Um, that's my recollection of that. And almost apparently out of nowhere in, in the final phases of this, McDonnell Douglas ended. And they had a fine airplane. But so did we. And I, we believed at the time that the uh, superior strength as perceived by the Air Force or the Pentagon of the McDonnell Douglas Corporation um, and, the, and its ability to manage the program was the reason that they were selected. The 8-9-A-10 was, uh, the, were the two entries into the AX program, which was our first uh, foray into a fly-off. Now, uh, prototypes were built for fixed price. I think the public charged something like $40 million, but used a lot more than that to field um, two prototype A-10s. And similarly, Northrop fielded two A-9s. The first flight of our A-10 was in 16 months. So from award of contract to the first flight of our first prototype was uh, 16 months, which is what you even could do in 1970 if it's undocumented prototype work not a lot of paper. So these two airplanes were flown first by company pilots and then turned over to a team from the Air Force to go through a whole procedure in flight and in other logistics analyses, the whole oil of wax, to determine which one would be the winner. Uh, that was a different approach than the things that were done in the days of the other other Thunder aircraft. The four aircraft, two from each company, were flown at, uh, over a period of many months at Edwards Air Force Base. Were you present? Oh, yes. And, and so, was this a nail-biting time? Oh, absolutely. Well, tell me about that. Well, the, the first nail-biting time is after 16 months when our um, chief test pilot took the airplane off, right? Sam Nelson was the uh, pilot, and uh, he, had, he had done simulator work. I went with Sam to Moffett Field in California where they had a large uh, mobile simulator where we put the characteristics of RA-10 in there, and he got uh, practice in flying the airplane by a simulator. Well, he took it off. And that was a gear down test. We did not collapse the or retract the gear during that test. And 
seem to behave the way, at least in those low-speed flights, the way we intended to. So that, I think, is the first male biter. You know, first flights are like that. You know? Right. Will it fly? <laughs> yeah. And um, we had an incident in, uh, as, the, as the testing went on. We had two prototypes, right? And one of the young captains, fine man, uh, always liked him. He landed the uh, one of our prototypes in uh, in a controlled crash. In other words, I, I think that uh, he accepted the blame for judgment, and I think he blew out the tires. Right? When you blow out the tires on an airplane, bad things happen, and you do some damage. But uh, we had some really good engineers who went out and fixed that airplane. And it was back in the air in a matter of maybe weeks, see? I know that the uh, young captain that flew it got out of the airplane and threw his helmet on the ground. He was so upset of what happened that put us at a potential disadvantage, you know. But it's the kind of people that work for the Air Force, the kind of people that we had that let's just go fix it and go on from here. For a while I was preliminary design manager and I was responsible for leading our engineers and manufacturing people uh, in design of our airplane. And it's pretty ugly. And Mr. Cartbelly, the biggest part about it that he really was unhappy was the wing selection in terms of, of its thickness and camber. And uh, that was selected in order to meet a low speed maneuvering requirement, a sustained maneuvering requirement at about 150 knots. So Mr. Carvelli, of course, had been working up in high mark numbers. Speed was everything. So we had many debates, he and I, about uh, thin wing, thick wing, and all that. Um, we never really resolved it. However, when the contract was awarded to uh, the public over Northrop, hopefully that means we had a superior airplane and all things consumed, and it met the requirements, but it was designed to meet the requirements, he came to me and he said, Monsieur Lusanato, you were right. I, I mean, I will never, ever forget that. What would you say his legacy is by any channel? What would you say? Well, the legacy that uh, Mr. Cartbelli would uh, be responsible for is the entire family oh. aircraft, and it's substantial. Many different kinds of airplanes developing from the technology of the 20s and the 30s right up until the 70s. And to a historian or someone who visits the museums and looks up the aircraft, his uh, Fingerprints are all over them. Republic's airplanes have been used in many different ways. Mr. Cotvelli's designs from the B-47 Thunderbolt and the Thunder series right up to Thunderbolt II have a linkage. And the linkage comes from all of the uh, engineering talent that grew in that time period. People that worked on the AX or A-10 for us were there years before and learned about ground attack and close air support and how to design things. So one could see that the Thunderbolt II uh, was generated out of the long history reaching back to the original Thunderbolt. From the aerodynamics work, which I did uh, for eight, nine years, then more project work, uh, working on the aerospace plane, on hypersonic vehicles, 
uh, the F-15 uh, project, uh, which was our proposal, that was eventually gone to McDonnell Douglas. And of course, uh, I was a principal on the AX competition, which uh, pitted uh, Northrop's A-9 against the uh, Republic, Fairchild Republic A-10. And I spent a lot of time first as the chief technical engineer on that A-10 or AX, and uh, then as the deputy program manager when it became a development and production, full-scale development, and went from there to senior vice president of the uh, company dealing with technology and business administration, business development, sorry. And then was fortunate enough to be selected to uh, become president. So that in a nutshell, takes care of 35 years of uh, involvement with Republic. What are you most proud of? I think the things that stay in my mind, the one thing that stays in my mind uh, is the A-10 program, because that was bringing the uh, company back from the grave. In 1970 dollars, it is a program that brought $5 billion, which is not much these days, but in 1970 it was a lot of money for a program that provided uh, work, opportunity for development, and more chances uh, to succeed. So that is the single most important impact on me and what the, the most important memories I have. Summing up, I would say that uh, the story of Republic Aviation uh, is a great story and that it uh, covered the waterfront. It was a leader. Aviation, the art of aeronautics, began with the dreamers, inventors, and daredevils who dared to defy gravity. The journey of aviation was nurtured by pioneers like the Wright brothers, whose first flight marked a historic milestone. The role of aircrafts in world wars was groundbreaking, dramatically changing warfare strategies. This initiated a technological evolution in aviation, transforming the simplistic wings of a biplane into the thunderous roar of jet engines. Let's journey through the ages of aviation. Behind every great aircraft, there were great minds. These visionaries, like Sir Frank Whittle, the innovator of the turbojet engine, redefined air travel. Then there's Skunk Works Kelly Johnson, the genius behind the SR-71 Blackbird. His designs combined speed, stealth and power, crafting machines that dominated the heavens. The contributions of these pioneers have left an indelible mark on the canvas of aviation, shaping the course of history and inspiring generations of engineers and aviators. Each epoch in aviation history gave birth to extraordinary aircrafts, each with their own unique features and roles. The Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird was a marvel of speed and stealth. The F-105 Thunderchief, a supersonic fighter bomber, was vital in the Vietnam War. The P-51 Mustang, a long-range fighter, was critical in World War II. The P-47 Thunderbolt, a heavyweight fighter, was used extensively in the same war. The A-10 Thunderbolt II, the Warthog, is a close air support icon. The Messerschmitt ME262 marked a leap forward in aviation technology. Each of these game changers were instrumental in their eras and their legacies still resonate today. Beyond the game changers, there are those that have transcended their practical roles to become icons. The Concorde was not just an aircraft, it was a supersonic symbol of luxury and speed. The B-52 Stratofortress, a strategic bomber, is an icon of power and resilience. These magnificent machines and others like them have become much more than just aircrafts. 
They are enduring icons that encapsulate the audacious spirit, the relentless innovation, and the boundless ambition that define the world of aviation. For more amazing aerial footage, and to join us in this incredible journey, check out the Dronescape's YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.